Now, uh, we're happy to have her speaking today, and she'll be speaking on the emergence of ordinary objects. Thank you very much. And I also I just want to say this has been a great, great conference. So, so uh, I don't know, just interesting and such great engagement between uh, people who have physical sort of talks as well as scientific talks. Really, probably the best uh, philosophy of science and physics conference I've ever been at. And uh, just thanks so much for being this on. Uh, thanks everybody for participating. So I detected some themes in the other talks, and so I want to also give a bonus talk that's going to pick up, very short bonus talk, that will pick up on some of the uh, metaphysical themes. So the bonus talk is called A Puzzle About Progress in Metaphysics and Physics. And this is going to pick up in particular in a bookendy kind of way on Stathis' talk and um, also, I think, on Laura's talk and maybe on John's as well as a bunch of other stuff. So it's just a very quick way that um, sort of way of I have been thinking about some of these issues that I think uh, maybe others will find it useful. So the, the, the key idea here is that we're going to distinguish between uh, sort of vertical progress in uh, some discipline versus horizontal progress in that discipline. And the idea is that like vertical progress in a, in a discipline will start with some basic presuppositions and then what you have are the practitioners of that discipline, kind of working out the uh, presuppositions, looking at their consequences, making sure the theory is internally consistent, seeing how it fits in with other stuff. So this is, you know, it's usually associated with something like normal science, right? So, you know, on the, on the kind of caricature of the Kuhnian view. So that's what the normal scientists are doing. They're taking these framework assumptions and they're working them, developing, and so on. That's vertical progress, as I've uh, characterized it. But there's this other thing that's known as horizontal, you can uh, characterize it as horizontal progress. And that is where you just jump to a different set of framework assumptions, and then maybe if you're interested in it, you go ahead and you work those out. And um, I think what's kind of interesting is that um, in some areas, for example, art, mathematics, and so on, there seems to be no problem with there being multiple different frameworks along the horizontal dimension. You know, let a thousand different conceptual or whatever frameworks bloom in those areas. Um, however, in uh, metaphysics, we've got you know mo multiple different frameworks. For example, we we'll have the Humean framework, broadly speaking, and the non-Humean framework. Uh, and today, I think throughout the conference, we've also been seeing that, notwithstanding the Kuhnian caricature, even at, especially at the most fundamental levels of physical theorizing, we're having a lot of underdetermination in different frameworks for understanding the interpretation of these stories as well. So uh, we've got these different kinds of uh, frameworks, but on the other hand, neither in science nor I think in metaphysics in particular is there a supposition that these are all equally okay, you know, like other things being equal, you know, unless you have some pressure towards anti-realism. You know, I play metaphysician. I assume there is a w one world, and there somehow there should be a fact of the matter about like what that world is. And I think the scientists too, unless they were going to be pressured, they're interested in understanding natural reality. So there's a puzzle here. How is it that we've got these multiple frameworks or different different sets of people are just working working them, take them to be the right way of going, and yet you know each thinking that there's you know you know supposing that there's only one real story. So it's kind of a puzzle here, and I think there's two kind of ways to go as regards uh, resolving the puzzle. One of them is kind of the traditional understanding of Karnat, where you say, oh yeah, he's, he's going anti-realist. Uh, basically, you've got to say, at least metaphysically, there's no fact of the matter, and a lot of metaphysicians these days, you know, Karnatian are kind of taking that line. But then there's an alternative way, which is kind of like Stathis's uh, alternative uh, way of understanding Karnat, which I think is, in my view, more accurate, uh, picking up on the epistemological concerns and also picked up in Laura's view, Laura's talk, where she's kind of agnostic. Um, you know, maybe right now we, have, we might think, well, I don't know, maybe theoretically we're not going to ever end up being able to reconcile these, but, you know, still remaining agnostic. And I think really the answer to the puzzle of why it is we've got these multiple different frameworks notwithstanding, we think only one can really be correct, generally speaking, is that, that just to, we're, we're, we're not anywhere near the end of the methodological inquiry. We don't have the standards. Carnap was right about that. We don't have uh, agreement on what it would take for a metaphysical theory to be right, all things considered. And similarly, this is infecting fundamental physics. So that's my little bonus talk to just say, you know, I see this theme and um, I think it's uh, 
It's important to recognize that we are at this stage of methodological inquiry because if not, then there's this tendency to be very dogmatic and that can hurt both metaphysics and it can hurt science. So in metaphysics you get, we've seen a lot of dogmatism, for example, you know, the Humean view, you know, Hume, Hume as interpreted by Lewis, that, you know, if you've got people at top institutions who are saying, you know, Hume's dictum is correct, no metaphysically necessary connections between dis, uh, distinct existences, etc. And you have everybody say, okay, that's the project, let's work it out. Other ways of thinking about reality that involve powers and dispositions get kind of shunted off. So we shouldn't be dogmatic at this point, we should be as ecumenical as possible. So I think. Okay, now, back to the original topic. Um, which also, I think, has, um, this is going to be a little exercise in first order metaphysical theorizing, but I think there's a meta metaphysical payoff here, which picks up on another theme of the conference, which is that, you know, most metaphysicians, and I think philosophers of science who are interested in kind of interpretive issues and stuff, uh, want their metaphysics to be sensitive to naturalistic and, phys you know, physical theorizing and so on and so forth. However, there's a kind of line of thought according to which if we pay too much attention to the sciences, we may find that this is going to lead metaphysically to some very unsavory results. Maybe reductionism, that's bad enough. Even worse, a limitivism about, for example, ordinary objects. So what I want to show is that, um, you know, there's a way that you might uh, sort of move in that direction. And Amy Thomason, for example, supports this idea that metaphysics and science shouldn't have really anything to do with each other. Metaphysics is not, the subject matter is not matters of fact, rather it's meaning and descriptions, right? Going back to this idea of conceptual analysis or something like how do we use our words. And part of the reason she endorses this easy ontology view is because she thinks, you know, there's all these problems with trying to take ordinary objects metaphysically, naturalistically, seriously, as somehow or another, you know, grounded in uh, fundamental physical goings on and so on. So I want to, in my first order uh, efforts here, I want to say, oh, no, that's okay. We're okay. We can be oh. scientifically informed uh, metaphysicians, um, and we're, we don't, we're not going to be forced to move to a kind of deflationary view of metaphysics. Okay, so that's the metaphysical import, metaphysical import, which I think picks up also on a bunch of stuff you've been saying. So uh, just to start off, there's there are these broadly pre-theoretic, pre-theoretic pre uh, in quotes because you know the evidence that occurs is here are broadly coming from the special sciences and the relations to the sciences and the idea, the natural idea that uh, the sciences exhibit this kind of broadly hierarchical structure where composed uh, entities uh, depend on lower level configurations, configurations of lower level entities, um, both in being materially composed by these lower level entities and in that their features, the features of the higher, you know, higher level uh, composed entities depend on the features of their composing entities when those entities are properly configured. Okay, so, you know, take your favorite example. Um, since I'm, uh, I don't have a ton of time, I'm just going to assume that people are on, kind of see what I'm talking about there clear enough. Um, the two key features of metaphysical emergence of these higher level entities, um, well, the idea is that metaphysical emergence is a concept that would kind of pick up on these pre-theoretic uh, appearances, whereby at least some uh, natural entities uh, treated by the special sciences are on the one hand, they're dependent, broadly synchronically dependent, so at a time or over a given interval, they you know, their existence and their features depend on the existence and the features of the entities that compose them when properly configured. And yet, in spite of this clear dependence, there's also, also seems to be a kind of autonomy associated with these entities, both uh, ontological, which is to say they appear to be distinct, as per, say, the distinct taxonomies of special sciences, uh, and they also appear to be, uh, so that's ontolog ontological autonomy, they also seem to have a certain causal autonomy, again, looking at special sciences where the typically causal uh, special science laws. So it looks like we've got this level picture where we've got clear dependence and yet some kind of ontological and causal autonomy associated with these entities. So those are the pre-theoretical uh, appearances, broadly speaking, there's this question, can we make sense of them? One of the uh, primary, perhaps the primary reason to think we can't has been offered by Jack Kim and other people, 
uh, which is associated, and now here is where kind of attention to the sciences is, is coming in to cause a problem for our usual assumptions. Um, Kim's, notwithstanding, you know, the target is special science entities, but again, uh, Kim's overdetermination argument. So this argument depends on six premises. Uh, four of them uh, pertain to special science entities in particular, and then uh, two of them pertain to causation. Okay, so these are uh, as follows. So the first is that special sciences broadly and chronically depend on lower level physical entities and con configurations as, as Kim is taking them to be. So some, you know, for example, um, you know, that uh, chair will depend on some complex relational entity that consists in whatever the physical fundamenta are standing in the physical, uh, physical the fundamental physical relations and so on. Um, so they're dependent in this way. They're real. We're not uh, eliminatists. They're real. Uh, they're efficacious. They're efficacious either vis-a-vis -vis themselves, but also vis-a-vis -vis physical goings on, depending on the special science issue. You might want to allow one or the other, or both. Um, and then uh, we've got that they're distinct. So this is, again, uh, reflecting the pre-theoretical appearances of ontological autonomy. And then the fifth and sixth premises concern uh, causation. So the fifth is this idea of the causal closure of physics. So every lower level physical effect has a purely lower level physical cause. Okay. So, um, and then six, and finally, there's no systematic causal overdetermination. So if you, if you have an effect, it has one uh, sufficient cause, broadly speaking. So the idea is that it's not incoherent to have overdetermination in these firing squad cases, where maybe you have the one death that was uh, equally um, caused by each of the two shootings or whatever else. Um, but in general, there isn't systematic overdetermination of that sort. And so what is interesting is to see that given these uh, premises, the rejection of each of these premises corresponds to one of the main uh, kind of comprehensive uh, views on natural reality. So if you reject one, you are endorsing something like a form of uh, substance dualism, maybe pan or proto-psychism in the relevant sense, but definitely the idea if you don't have real dependence, you think these two things can come apart in some strong way. You're going broadly Cartesian there. If you reject that special, scientist entity, uh, special science entities are real, then you're going for eliminativism of the sort that was, uh, it's been uh, endorsed by the Churchlands, for example. If you say, if you deny that they're efficacious, then you're going for epiphenomenalism. And if you deny that they're distinct, then you're going for reductionism, ontological reductionism, according to which it's like that chair rep is in fact identical to some complex combination made disjunctive of the lower level physical goings on. And this is, of course, Kim's favorite, uh, Kim's favorite response. If you reject causal closure, there I think you are endorsing something like robust, um, robust emergentism of the, you know, broadly speaking, British emergent variety that C.D. Broad and certain others endorse. So um, the sort that were there any, you would falsify physicalism, at least in this sense that there's, uh, there are, uh, some effects are not caused just by lower level, other uh, lower level physical causes. And if you, um, if you reject no systematic over determination, well, on a very plausible, well, on the, uh, the best way of understanding what that would mean, you want to be kind of a compatibilist. You want to say, in fact, there could be that more than one entity or feature could be causing it, but look, there's no real problem there. And that is where I think the non-reductive physicalist comes into play. Okay. All right. So there are four basic ways of responding to the uh, Kim style over determination argument. Now, of these, um, six <laughs> strategies, in my view, only two will accommodate the intuitions of metaphysical emergence, okay? So uh, this doesn't because it rejects dependence, this doesn't because <laughs> it rejects reality, this doesn't because it uh, rejects causal autonomy, 
<laughs> this does include sort of just ontological autonomy. That leaves five and six. So five, I associate robust emergence is what, or uh, robust emergence system is what, I'm going to strong emergence, and then non-reductive disclosing will be associated with weak emergence. So these are the two strategies. And start just with strong emergence, because that's a little more straightforward to defend. So your, <coughs> excuse me, the idea is that basically how are we going to make sense of this idea is that you've got your lower level complex physical configuration and then something fundamentally new comes into play. My, my favorite way of making sense of that is to say, okay, well, it's like a new fundamental interaction or field or something like that. And I think there are ways of making naturalistic good sense of that. I think the weak nuclear force, for example, also comes around at a sort of complex level of organization. So there's nothing especially mysterious about this. We don't necessarily have any good evidence for this now. I have an empirical test. If anyone is interested, I, want, I need to write a grant, grant to test it out. But the basic idea here is if uh, special science entity is going to be strongly emerging from some lower level um, P, just in case it is S synchronically depends on P, <coughs> and S has a token power not had by P. <coughs> now the notion of power here, I'm also going to appeal to a notion of power to make sense of weak emergence, but I just want to clarify that the notion of power I have in mind is extremely lightweight, metaphysically speaking. Uh, I don't require that, say, properties be essentially or exhaustively individuated by their powers. Basically, talk of powers is a way of talking about the contributions that, uh, you know, a feature or property can have uh, to an object's producing some effect. So, so long as you think that there is causation, and as long as you think that what uh, effects an entity can bring about depend on, or somehow, on what features they have, then you can accept power in the way that I, the very lightweight way I'm talking about here. Even a contingentist, categoricalist, human could accept powers in the very lightweight sense that I have at issue here. Okay, so here the basic idea is you can have, you can be uh, strongly emergent, you can be a strongly emergent special science entity, basically if you have a new power, a new fundamental power, and if you have a new power, it's clear how you're going to satisfy uh, these, um, these constraints or these uh, conditions on emergence we've built in with the first condition that we've got dependence, and that's cool. What about ontological and causal autonomy? Well, if this guy has a new power that this guy doesn't have, then by Leibniz's law, this guy is different. And uh, if this guy has the power that this guy hasn't had in particular cause and no effect, then uh, this guy will not be just different, as maybe the epic phenomenalists could allow, but also will be causally autonomous. So uh, this understanding of strong emergence makes sense of how you could have uh, a, uh, an, a metaphysically emergent special science entity. Of course, Kim doesn't like to go this way because he doesn't want to reject causal closure. Many people won't want to do that, but it's just uh, important to realize that is an option. Weak emergence is the sort that most uh, philosophers of science, naturalists, and so on will find more compatible. Now, this is a more uh, interesting form of emergence. So here we have a new power. What I want to say here is that what we have are a proper subset of powers. Um, you know what, I just realized I didn't really set out what the problem is. Uh -huh. Is there anyone here who's not familiar with Kim's overdetermination argument? I can do the little box if you want, very quickly. Shall I? Okay, good. Okay, here it is. I'll take just a second. This is the Kim box. Okay. Special science S, uh, S. Listen, there's two cases. Let's suppose S is efficacious in causing S prime. S is dependent on some lower level physical entity P, so is S prime. P prime. Okay? By causal closure, P prime is produced by purely uh, lower level um, physical cause without lots of generality, let it be P. Okay, good. Now it looks like P brings about P prime and then P prime, you know, basically with at least nomological necessity, brings about S prime, so there's a case to be made, or so Kim claims 
that P also causes S prime. So now we have overdetermination uh, by S and P on the assumption that S is not equal to P. Okay? Case two. S downwardly causes P prime. Now we've got you know immediate overdetermination. So that's the chem box, those are the two cases, and that's the problem, seeming overdetermination. Okay. So strategy is corresponding, avoiding the over overdetermination there. We talked about strong emergence. One way to get around that is to basically here the basic idea is to say that <coughs> um, oh, I won't talk anymore about strong emergence. But uh, the idea is that you get the extra power over here, um, so you don't end up with uh, basically P doesn't cause the effect that <coughs> S does, because it doesn't have the, the requisite power. Weak emergence, though, the idea is that we're going to have dependence of S on P, and then S is going to have not more powers than P, but fewer powers than P. So this is another way to get the causal autonomy. The idea is that S is going to have only a proper subset of the token powers of P on that given occasion. And then again, looking at the conditions on emergence, you've got dependence. Autonomy, if S has a proper subset of token powers of P on that occasion, then again, by Leibniz's law, S is not going to be identical with P. And uh, also, now here's the tricky part, though. Could having a proper subset of the token powers of P be enough to get S the distinctive causal autonomy that's at, that's at issue in emergence? And I think this is the trickiest part of this deal. Alyssa doesn't think so. I think so. And I think there's various ways you can try to, to, to work this. But dialectically, let me just say that even though what I'm about to say is not going to force a reductionist to accept that this is a live possibility, if you want to be a reductionist, what I'm about to say is I'm going to convince you otherwise. But as somebody who just wants to preserve the pre-theoretical appearance, I'm just looking for a way to stay on my horse. So I'm going to give you a way that you can stay on your horse if you want to be a non-reductive. <laughs> so one kind of consideration has to do with uh, difference-making considerations. So in other words, I'm asking here, why think that S has only a proper subset of the token powers of P on a given occasion? Well, here's one thing, you know, suppose that S is a reaching or something like that, okay? Um, if my uh, the mental state of my intending to drink or whatever else had been realized by a slightly different physical state, would that effect still have occurred? Arguably, yes. So in the closest possible world, where that very highly uh, you know, specific physical state doesn't occur, my mental state still occurs. It's my mental state is, you know, it doesn't care so much about the uh, microphysical details. So in that case, it looks like there's um, some uh, the the powers that are distinctively associated with my mental state, as opposed to its physical realizers, on a given occasion. Uh, you know, those might be the ones that are most relevant, or at least as relevant, to the production of the effect. So this is where the distinctive efficacy comes into play. I don't have to say that the physical goings on aren't relevant. All I need to uh, get causal autonomy is that they're distinctively relevant. So there's a distinctive relevance that I'm trying to associate with the possession of a certain set of powers, as opposed to the possession of a specific single power, as in the case of strong words. Difference-making considerations, I, I suggest, um, provide some kind of one route to seeing that the power profile, so to speak, of a feature may be relevant, as opposed to just the individual powers. Another one is just uh, sort of an abstract level of causal brain associated not with counterfactual considerations, but just with basically nomological sufficiency. So you look at the laws, the special science laws that are governing these entities, and you see that they do not contain degrees of freedom or other specifications that are relevant to the microphysical details. These special science laws, in a way, I, I like to think of them 
as kind of tracking at an abstract level of causal brain. So there is again kind of support for thinking that those that brain is reflected in the distinctive <coughs> minor, uh, uh, reduced set of powers that are associated with a higher level entity, where basically the lower level details, well, definitely in some sense constitutive and obviously continuing to uh, serve as a dependent space, uh, are not all relevant to the goings on at this higher level. So difference making, uh, abstract level causal brain, there's also associated with difference making is also this idea that uh, higher level entities are multiply realizable. So you know the feature just again uh, is compositionally flexible, so to speak. So those are the two cases there, and I, I, you know, I have argued in gory detail, sometimes more scientifically. So I have a paper called Non-Reductive Physicalism and Degrees of Freedom, where I try to look specifically at eliminations and degrees of freedom as kind of a scientifically acceptable way of making out this this uh, pattern. I also think the determinable determinant relation gives you another way that's also kind of metaphysically interesting of instantiating the schema for weak emergence and so on. So, so far so good with special science entities. Now I want to just quickly turn to uh, Merrick's overdetermination argument. Merrick's has an argument against over uh, against ordinary objects, which is sim very similar to Kim's over determination argument with an important difference, which again is the thing that inspired Amy Thompson to say, oh, we better just do easy ontology and not have metaphysics be, you know, kind of continuous with science. And that is to say that he thinks there's a problem of over determination even between the individual lower level guys and their features and any relational aggregate. So for Kim, the dependent space was a relational entity. So he was cool with reduction because reduction is presumably a one-to-one -one relation. Identity is a one-to-one -one relation. I can identify the chair with that single relational aggregate. But for Merrick, he doesn't think that there are relational aggregates either. So since identity can't be one many, although some people argue that it is, that's why he goes for eliminativism. So he says there are no tables, there are no chairs, for basically the same reason that Kim does. Okay. Now, I don't think there's a huge difference here at the end of the day because I think you can talk about the powers of a plurality as well as the powers of a relational aggregate. Given that that's true, the short end to my little story here is that we can apply the same categories and the same kinds of uh, ways of resolving Kim's uh, overdetermination concerns to Merrick's overdetermination concerns with the case of ordinary objects. And so basically the idea is that we're going to either reject five by taking, uh, say, a baseball, for example, to um, be strongly emergent. Now that sounds silly, but I'll try to make a little bit more sense of that in a minute. Or take it to be weakly emergent, a la the non-reductive physicalist. A baseball has like a proper subset of the token powers of its uh, atomic or whatever realizers on a given occasion. Taking the latter uh, kind of uh, strategy first, I think is plausible. We can apply kind of the same difference-making considerations to the baseball. Same baseball, even though we scraped it or somebody wrote on it. Um, so that's okay. We've got some considerations there. Now, of course, an important difference between the special science case and this case is that we don't have the laws of nature to point to. So I have been resting over here kind of heavy uh, weight on the fact that we have these special science laws that are tracking an abstract level of brain. We don't have those, but we have our rules of baseball, something like that. Okay, but maybe that's good enough. Strong emergence, how about, so work weak emergent uh, ordinary object? Sure, why not? Strong emergence, you might say, well, that's crazy. Maybe if you have a mental state, you can kind of get your head around the idea that there's a new fundamental inter mental interaction that that sounds a little crazy, but a new baseball interaction? Uh -huh. I don't think so. However, you might try to make sense of this by really locating the strong emergence of baseballs or artifacts or statues or works, whatever, um, in the strong emergence, if there were such, of human beings that create them or set up the normative or other standards uh, for their uh, existence and persistence conditions. So, you know, maybe, if humans are strongly emergent. Okay, 
So that's it, and uh, I hope metaphysics, scientifically informed metaphysics, is for the present safe from the deflationary uh, metaphysics of Amy Thompson and others. Subset of token powers, uh, it's, uh, I find it problematic because if I if I drive my car with 100 kilometers, I drive it with at least 50. It's the same object. Uh, they are not, not two distinct distinct objects, but nonetheless there are two different sets of causal powers. So don't you presuppose distinctness in in emergence that you've got two distinct objects already and they are such that um, they are dependent on each other and one of them has a subset of the causal powers. I'm sorry, I didn't follow the car example. Could you get, could you uh, Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's probably silly, but, but you know, it, it, it's, the weak emergence argument is supposed to show how I can get two distinct entities. That's okay. right. And, and they must be synchronically dependent on each other, and the causal powers of, of the one should be a subset of the causal powers of the other. Right, on an occasion. On an right. occasion. Yeah. So, so, so when I drive my car 100k, I drive it with at least 50 kilometers an hour per hour. It's the same object nonetheless. And, 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 to, uh, uh, and, and there is a subset of powers in, in, in the 50k case. So 50 and 100. 100, yes. But, but, but can I just say, I'm not really addressing that case. That case is, a, a, is a, a kind of a far extension from the sort of broadly synchronic dependence that I'm talking about. That's a hard case. And I'm not really, at this point, trying to accommodate that case. If you could put it, put your case in um, terms that involve just like, you know, at this moment, there's your car and there's its physical basis. At that moment, if there's that relation between the token powers, that's the sort of case, simple case that I'm trying to address. I think the intuition, yeah. pardon me if I'm wrong, is why are you describing emergence but not like retreat? Sorry, could you emergence and not what? Retreat or recession, recession with the thing. Yeah, that's a good that's a good way to put it. I mean I I, I, I thought I, I thought this subset idea was not sufficient for for having two objects. You can have, you know, and, and you present it as if it's sufficient, part of a sufficient condition. Synchronic synchronic dependence plus uh, a subset. And if they have different sets of token powers, how could it not be that they're different on that occasion? Yeah. But I think your, your, your question also is something that I could... They're different, right, though, by Leibniz's law. No? Are you trying to say then they're not really, there's not really a subset of powers that's associated with the higher level feature? I mean, that's what the reductionists will say. It's not a new thing, it's a part of an old thing. Say that again. It's not a new thing. It's a part of an old. Yeah, thing. that's that's what that's what my that's good. my intuition. I that's mean, that intuition. Not, okay, good. It's not quite a new thing. Look, it's it's occupying this you know this zone of very intimate dependence on the old thing, but still the idea is that there's cases to be made that's reasonable to to offer in support of thinking that it is a different thing that are associated with these difference making considerations, for example. So your very car at that moment. Right, it's, you know, it, it, it's could a be more making realized problem. by, you know, if it had uh, fewer yeah. molecules or something like that, that wouldn't make any difference whatsoever to the identity of the car, but the relational aggregate would have gone away, right? So uh, that's, that's more like an ontological point concerning multiple realizability, but there's an, a related causal point, which is that, you know, the things that your car you know, can characteristically do, had better not be depend in such a fine-grained way on the precise microstructural details. But isn't that a bit different? I mean, you, you, some, some people, uh, some, some people say 
kinds or objects are identified by, by the pers persistence conditions. So, 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 so my car has a different set of persistence conditions than the set of its molecules. Yeah. Because if a few molecules are chipped off for some reason in the same car, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. does that make it an emergent? It does, a, it does according to me. I think there's so, a case to be made from those that difference. In fact, I think that this, this, uh, this schema can provide an explanation for why the how it is is an answer to the grounding problem. I didn't talk about this, but there's this other grounding problem that faces ordinary objects in particular. Like, how can they both, suppose your car and the uh, microphysical aggregate come into existence at exactly the same time and go out of existence at exactly the same time. Uh, like Alan Gibbard's Lumpel and Goliath case, right? Then, since they are completely uh, um, coincidence throughout their spatio-temporal history, how could the one, how could the car have any different modal conditions or properties than the uh, the constituent faces? And then I think this uh, this sort of consideration actually provides you with an explanation of how that can be. That is to say, it has uh, the persistence conditions for the car are more flexible in certain respects, right? Because they don't care, they don't include the, uh, the specific powers or associated you know, modes of existence of the microphysical aggregate. So this potentially provides an explanation for modal flexibility and thus an answer to the grounding problem. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Jessica. I want to ask you about uh, how we might or might not want to connect uh, the issues that you're talking about here with respect to ways of thinking about uh, ontological or metaphysical emergence with the kind of discussion of emergence that I see a lot in the philosophy of science, mm -hmm. which has to do with explanatory right. emergence. So let me just give you a, a case, and then you can tell me whether the case is neutral with respect to strong or weak emergence, or whether it favors one or the other. Um, so this is a an example that is discussed by Alan Garfinkel, but a lot of people have talked about it, right? Foxes and rabbits, you come across this. Um, at the, the ground level, so this is your P, right? yeah. there are foxes and rabbits in a forest, and when they encounter each other, there are foxes and rabbits, so on and so forth. Yeah. At uh, a kind of aggregate of level, this is your special science level, we have populations of foxes and populations of rabbits. Yeah. And he argues that there are certain kinds of things that we can explain at the level of populations that we can't really explain very well at the level of individual foxes and individual rabbits. Um, we want to know, in a particular context, why a particular rabbit died. We might not be interested in the particular details of the fox that ate it in a particular kill space at a particular time. We might be interested in the fact that the population of foxes is very high, and this increases the probability that a given rabbit is going to be eaten, and so on and so forth. So that's the kind of, the idea there is that there are things that can be explained at the the top level that can't really be well explained at the bottom level. Now, it's hard to think about in terms of, I think, uh, weak emergence, because it's hard to think about in terms of powers at the level of populations that are a subset, a proper subset of powers at the lower level. But is that a case of um, strong emergence? Is there a new power coming into being? So how should we think about the relationship? How should you think about that? Yeah. Um, well, if I were going to place a bet, I would say that is a case of weak emergence. And it's just you have your physical substrate there would be a, like a practically a you know regional space, dependence space, right? Very complex. And the idea would be that um, there is there are fewer powers that are associated with the with the entity that's so composed. Now the relational aggregate there though is. It's not foxes and rabbits, right? It's it's the <laughs> I don't know what it is. Yeah, the anim, uh, <laughs> the animal specific uh, dependent space, so to speak, right? So the population entity, the ecosystem, is not sensitive to the animal specific details in something like the way that the baseball or the chair or the uh, the rose or whatever is not sensitive to every micro physical detail. So there's an exact parallel there in that case. Now how to actually draw that out is a kind of an interesting question. And one thing I want to note is that I've just said if here, okay? Um, this is a way of making sense of weak emergence. And I think there are instances of it. Uh, Kate, I don't want to suggest that everything that has ever been suggested as being potentially metaphysically emergent 
right? Or explanatory in a way that would suggest there might be some underlying metaphysical emergence should be understood in this way. <coughs> Just as a qualifier. I mean, I'd have to, you'd have to do some work, but I don't see any in principle problem with thinking of the powers of the ecosystem being a proper subset of the powers of the animalistically, uh, the animalistic aggregate, so to speak. Yeah, uh, I don't see any reason to think that it's strongly emergent. Yeah, new, no, I don't think there's any reason to think there's an ecosystem fundamental interaction, unless the Gaia hypothesis is true. Well, in this case, it wasn't so much the ecosystem that has the powers, but it's, the it's a population of yeah. organisms that has the power. Good. Um, and so then, what would the, just to follow this through a little bit, mm -hmm. right, what would the subset of the token powers be in this case? It's just, you know, the, the animalistic aggregate has all these powers to pr produce changes that in the world that are ultimately going to be fundamental, physically uh, describable changes, right? Okay, those changes uh, are less specific. Those cause, the causal powers that are associated with animalistic aggregate, uh, you know, those powers are gonna be a proper subset of the powers of the fundamental physical aggregate that is continuous with all those guys. And similarly, just kind of are removing some of the, any of those powers, say, of the, uh, the population entity, whatever that is, um, uh, doesn't include things like having uh, a rabbit in this location at that time, yeah. right? What it does is it's, you know, it's sensitive to just sort of uh, statistical features of the animalistic aggregate, and it just abstracts away from those guys. That's the suggestion. I think it's clearer in these other cases where, you know, uh, in the degrees of freedom paper, you know, looking at cases like you have a, an electromagnetic sphere or something like that, and you know, seventy degrees of freedom are eliminated, right? Electromagnetic degrees of freedom are eliminated. So those are very simple cases. These more more complex biological cases. You know, I agree, it's hard to see exactly how it's supposed to work, but you know, in principle, it might not be a problem. As far as it's the connection between explanatory considerations and metaphysical considerations, that's another big topic. You know, in general, I don't think that explanatory considerations themselves are going to motivate metaphysical version. Carl. So this question kind of follows up or, or continues to, it was inspired by Anjan's question because I was, I've always been not bothered by the, this, uh, and I've always been was puzzled about exactly where I want to get off the boat of the Kim argument. <laughs> and typically it's felt to me like the, the overdetermination is what doesn't bother me. And, and um, so you, you you gave a definition of power which I, I didn't exact I didn't catch fully, but it was, it was supposed to be innocuous enough that we're not a lot of people can accept the power powers. But, um, but it, suppose you're someone like um, Q, Q Price or or many other philosophers of science who really have this kind of Russellian disdain for causation talk, mm -hmm. and they, so they don't they don't even think that causation is really the right way to talk at the fundamental level. Then I'm not so sure that the, your innocuous definition of power is so innocuous for that kind of so That's right. if, if, you, if you don't really believe in causation yeah. as fundamental itself then and, and think of it instead in terms of something that's much more related to human interests mm -hmm. and human explanatory stories and stuff like that then it's more natural that you think oh sure why, why couldn't there be multiple stories to tell one at, yeah. the, at, the, at the particle level and another one at the population level or the table and chair level yeah, I think that's that's right, and um, there might be other ways of rejecting the no systematic uh, overdetermination from the set uh, of sort of the just suggested. Um, I did say that you know in order to kind of buy into these particular ways of uh, understanding emergence, metaphysical emergence, you had to at least think that there was causation, and agree that objects cause other cause events, events uh, cause other goings on uh, in virtue of having some properties rather than others. And if you don't, uh, you don't buy into that, then that, you know, even this very minimal notion of power is going to be too much for you. Uh, that said, I wonder if so long as you just like patterns of regularities, you know, supposedly they're going to allow that those are 
uh, well, that's not my view. controversial. Yeah, but, Maybe you can resurrect a kind of version or kind of reconfigure these this approach in terms not just not of talk of powers, but some kinds of regularities. Oh, wait. Um, I've never, I, I, I too have never really been bothered by kind of this, and let me just try to express why. So you, know, um, you hear this Kim box. Mm -hmm. So let's put let's put the causal error arrows in P to P prime, you know, S S to S prime. Okay. Um, and I, I think those vertical areas are supposed to mean so, so we've got a lower level level description, higher level level description. Or well, there are not descriptions, but yeah, okay. or, but, but sorry? Well there's supposed to be entities or features. Lower level entities, higher level entities. Okay. okay. And those upward areas are supposed to be supervenience. Uh, they're, yeah, the dependent supervenience might go in that direction, right. but yeah, they're basically the same thing. Right. So basically, this guy necessitates this guy with at least right. normal logical right. necessity. Okay. Well, I've always been tempted to draw then, you know, another arrow in the middle, so, you know, the upper level causal error arrow bears the same, it supervenes on the lower level causal arrow, or whatever oh, that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. So yeah, what yeah. So yeah, whatever that that relation is, yeah. you know, those two arrows. Those are two arrows are not really different. But they bear that same relation. Yeah. Good. And the and the reason and the reason like, and here's why it doesn't bother. I mean, when I try to think about these things, like the sort of yeah. the easiest examples I can think of is, you know, you know, I've got a bunch of molecules. The lower level description, you've got a bunch of molecules. You know, upper level entities, you've got a gas and a balloon. Yeah. The lower level goings on are molecules bouncing against each other and hitting the, you know, the, the walls of the balloon. Mm -hmm. The upper level properties are things like pressure and tension in the balloon. A blow into the balloon increases the number of molecules in there, increases the number of hits per, per unit time against you know, the molecules that make up the balloon. It, 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 um, you know, you know, so that's what, one way of talking about it. But I can also say the increase in pressure caused an increased tension in, 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 the, in, the, in the balloon. So I have no problem with, with having you know, that upper level causation there. But then I don't, I don't see any 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 real um, uh, problem. Is there over determination? Did the you know increase in tension of the balloon was it caused both by the increase of pressure and by the increase of number of molecules hitting against it? No, that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. Well, like, it's not a problem. But the question the, pro the question is really like, do you have to understand that reductively or not? You know, so clearly, if you're a physicalist, you're going to assume that no, there's not really, you know, competing causes here. Right. That's right. why, I mean, just to diagnose what, um, you know, uh, the non-reductivist wants to say to somebody like Kim, who says, "Oh, wow, this shows that you've got to be a reductionist." You know, they're going to say you have failed to appreciate that there's more than one kind of way for a feature to be distinctively efficacious. You thought the only way was if it had a fundamentally novel power, like. On strong versions, but having a proper subset of the token powers is good enough. So in the case that you're describing, you know, that's just going to be a paradigm case of potential weak emergence. And just to draw schematically the idea here is that let's just say this is um, this is uh, this is S, and this whole thing is P, right? And then here again would be S prime. This is P prime. And then the idea is that um, the production here, this is like a power, right? And there's just the one power manifesting on the occasion that brings about S prime. Mm -hmm. Okay? S does it, P does it. S does it basically, I mean, on the schema, the idea is the proper subset is here, right? I'm not claiming that S is a part of P, right. but there's this relation between the powers, just different ways to, you know, different metaphysical relations mm -hmm. that will preserve the idea that S has a proper subset of the token powers of P. But on a, any given occasion, the increase in tension or whatever, that's just, just one causing. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it's not like there's two powers like in a firing squad right. way. 
that are manifesting and producing the effect. There's just the one power, it's shared by the higher level property and the lower level property. A higher level property is constituted by only some of the powers of the lower level property, and in virtue of that, it's different. And you avoid problematic overdetermination because there's really only one power manifesting on the given whatever it is, one regularity that occurs on that given occasion in human terms. But you still get distinctness. And assuming that this um, distinctive set of powers is relevant, as it might be, because you could have the same pressure and volume and stuff, but completely different arrangement of the, the molecules and stuff, if there's difference making considerations, if there's a special scientific causal level of grain, et cetera, then you might have some reason for thinking that this, these distinctive powers kind of are tracking that distinctive comparatively abstract level of causal grain, and so they are in fact distinct. So this is just to provide a way of being, to say, okay, look, I don't think there's any incompatibility here, but to say that there's no incompatibility, do I have to follow Kim and be a reductionist and say that really, you know, chairs, you know, you are not distinct from a very complex application of molecules? No, you do not. Okay. Can I try something else? Yes. Now, is it, uh, if, if you follow weak emergencies, then you stay at the level of properties and, and, and entities you started with. So if you start with physical properties and you know, physical entities and physical properties, you stay at this level because the properties at the emergent levels are going to be subset of the original one. So you don't get global properties. Not true. Yeah, Not true. good. Thank, very good question. So another way of kind of uh, asking the question, is there any genuine metaphysical emergence of this variety? Is it another way of asking that? Say, are there, are there more than one levels? level? Uh, you know, as per the broadly theoretic appearances of the of a leveled structure of natural reality, with the special sciences broadly being like we were talking about earlier, with these branches off the trunk of physics, so to speak. Um, so it's of the utmost importance to be able to say that just because you have a proper subset of the powers, that doesn't mean you collapse down to the physical level. But that means you have to give a story, you have to tell a story about how you individuate levels, right? And which entities go into the quote unquote physical level. Which entities, in other words, would you allow the reductionist as part of their construction, constructivist re, uh, toolkit, right? Which resources do you give to the reductionist? Just as a case in point, you say, okay, I want to be a reductionist. I want to reduce, let's just talk about a molecule. Okay, I want to reduce this molecule M to a configuration of atoms. What do I get? Do I get just atoms and no atomic relations? No, I do not. I get the atoms, I get atomic relations. Do I only get like pairwise atomic relations? No, because then I'm stuck. Uh, because you know, maybe I have a big molecule. I get the atoms in any number, any number of atoms and any number of atomic relations. You might say, oh, that's not enough. What if the molecule is multiply realizable? Does the reductionist have to go home crying? No, they do not. Because what else do you give the reductionist? Any Boolean combinations, at least. You're gonna give them disjunction, conjunction. So the reductionist, you give all the, the reductionist all these resources. Then there's this further question about what properties, what features do we allow as being lower level features? My own view is that you can't just do this kind of combinat lightweight combination thing that I just did for a molecule. You have to look at the laws and let the laws unfold, right? And then those, the basically the consequences of the laws, importantly though, the consequences of the laws that contain all the degrees of freedom that are relevant to characterizing the entities that the laws treats. So for quantum mechanics, it's gonna have two kinds of laws that will be, con or two kinds of entities that might be con considered consequences of the quantum, quantum mechanical laws. Some of them will retain all the quantum degrees of freedom, right, spin and stuff like that. So that characterization of a consequence, then the laws of quantum mechanics can continue to work because they have what they need to do, right, to do their work. But some of those consequences will, in the classical limit, abstract away from spin and the characterization of this higher level special science entity, even though strictly speaking it's a deductive consequence or a metaphysical consequence in some relevant sense of the lower level physical laws, 
right? That should not be placed down at the physical level, according to me and my way of individuating levels, because that entity so characterized has some has lost some of the degrees of freedom, lost some of the information that the lower level quantum laws need to do its work. So if I go to the quantum laws and I say, here, here's a, uh, here's a chair. It has this shape and blah, blah, blah. The quantum laws are going to be like, I'm sorry, I do not know what to do with that chair. I, can, you know, I have no idea what to tell you about the evolution of that chair because I need to know what the spin is on every single feet quantum whatever constituting that chair. But your chair doesn't tell me that. So even though, all, basically the idea is there's only one way up, metaphysically and deductively, if such there be, from the lower level laws. But those guys don't collapse down, and the criteria of, of why they don't collapse down is if you've lost information of, in the, the deductive consequence, such that the lower level laws can no longer operate on them in the way that they would be able to if all that information had been reserved. So, that is my story of why it is that if you have a proper subset of powers here, right, and if that proper subset is associated in, the reason that there's a proper subset is you've abstracted away from the microphysical details and associated degrees of freedom in such a way that, you know, you've got an entity, but it's not an entity that the lower level entity laws could operate on without further information, and that's enough to pop you up to a new level. So you need laws also at the higher level? You, know, you need what? Laws, special, so it's... Yeah, well, usually I'm talking about the special science laws out here. Yeah, those would be the special science laws. And that's what's characteristic of a special science law. It's like, for the most part, it's getting rid of some of the lower level information yet preserving kind of an interesting causal level of brain. Okay, well, let's thank Jessica for...